Another season is over in the glorious world of the second tier of English football, the Championship. Here is a whistle-stop tour of what went on in the 2021-22 season. This latest incarnation of the division saw us say goodbye once again to Norwich and Watford with Brentford joining them in the Premier League last season. They were replaced by returning Fulham, Sheffield United and West Brom. At the other end, going in and out of League One, we saw Wednesday, Rotherham and Wickham going down and said a big hello to Hull, Peterborough and Blackpool. There were new faces in the dugouts as well. Marco Silva, Scott Parker and Slavisa Jekanovic were all expected to deliver promotion with their new jobs at parachute teams. Last season's hot property, Valerian Ishmael, made the jump from Barnsley to West Brom with Marcus Schott replacing him at Oakwell. Russ Martin jumped from MK Dons to replace the outgoing Steve Cooper. In the transfer market, things were fairly quiet post-Covid, but still some interesting deals back in summer. Harry Wilson landed at Fulham as a proven championship star. Rob Atkinson made the step up at Bristol City from Oxford. Victor Gulcarez is now a permanent fixture after some loans in the championship. He signed up at Coventry. Martin Payero looked like a big money signing in at Borough. And George Saville made his return to Millwall. Sam Surridge went off to Stoke and the treble of Oberfamey, Downs and Piero all landed at Swansea. Alex Mowat followed his former Barnsley manager Valerian Ishmael across to West Brom. The most significant new faces though? Well, returning faces. The fans back in stadiums at full occupancy after lots of football played behind closed doors in the Championship and various pilot schemes. We were back for this season and it kind of felt complete all over again. Except at Birmingham though where structural problems meant certain fans in certain areas of the grounds were going to have to wait a little bit longer to get back into their seats. By mid-September Fulham were in front with West Brom and Bournemouth also making good starts. Keeping pace in the top four were Coventry whose perfect home record and penchant for late goals was making them a good, fun watch. In the bottom six, relegated Sheffield United just weren't adjusting to Slavisa Jekanovic's style. Russ Martin was trying to do something similar with an ultra-possession approach that he'd used at MK over at Swansea and was very slowly getting his ideas across. Down at the very bottom, though, were Nottingham Forest with six defeats and a draw in their first seven games. That meant Chris Hewton was our first manager to go, replaced by Steve Cooper, whose first task was to get Forest out of the relegation zone. We'll check in with Cooper's progress as we go. Over at Derby, Mel Morris decided he'd had enough and after a seemingly endless battle with the EFL, he pressed the nuclear button and put Derby into administration. That automatic 12-point penalty immediately applied and the Rams bottom of the table on minus points. We reached the international break at the start of October with Bournemouth top and still undefeated under Scott Parker in the Championship. West Brom were in second but level on points with Red Hot starters Coventry in third. Stoke? were very, very well placed in fourth, uh, with by their standards a slump dropping Fulham down to fifth. Pre-season dark horses, QPR took the last top six spot. At the bottom, some worrying signs already. Peterborough had lost all five of their away games and two clubs were on alarming runs. Barnsley, no wins in nine under Marcus Schott and Cardiff had lost five on the bounce. Unfortunately for Cardiff, that run was going to continue the other side of the international break, stretching out to eight straight defeats. And a guy that used to be considered as a championship specialist was out of a job. Mick McCarthy replaced by Steve Morrison. 
Towards the end of October, someone seemed to light the fuse over at Blackburn, who are about to embark on a sensational points scoring run with Chilean striker Ben Brereton Diaz up top, about to become a regular international news story. Newly promoted Blackpool as well were taken to the championship very, very nicely and found themselves up in the top six under Neil Critchley after 15 games. Into November and that horrible run at Barnsley had just got worse and it was goodbye to Marcus Schott. After just 15 games in charge, it was a run of no wins in 13, a seven game losing streak and Schott was out of Oakwell before he barely started to be replaced by Poya Asbagi. International break number three in November is an absolutely fascinating signpost. Bournemouth are at a magnificent 40 points from 17 games, but they're about to drop off a bit. And so a West Brom who are going to drift away from that top two race from this point onward. At the bottom, we get a very strange run from Hull City who go and win four games in a row through November, seemingly out of nowhere and leave that very slow moving bottom three in their wake. That international break also saw Stokes' Harry Souter get injured on duty for Australia and he was then unavailable to the Potters for the remainder of the season. Some Stoke fans argue this was a turning point and they would ultimately drop nine places in the absence of the big centre half. The international break also saw the end of one of the greats of the championship and legendary English football management figures. Although we didn't know it at the time, Neil Warnock managed his last game for Middlesbrough over at West Brom. Legendary figure Warnock was replaced by another former championship promotion winner, Chris Wilder, up at the Riverside. The EFL were busy too during November, dishing out not one, but two FFP points deductions. Derby had a nine point sanction to add to their 12 for going into an administration that looked frankly like a death sentence for their championship status. Reading were also deducted six points which dropped them to just outside the relegation zone. That Blackburn run kept going towards the end of November. They went up the table all the way in to the top four. They were on the way up but on the way out was Slavisa Jukanovic. Two promotions from the championship on his CV, he's with a year one parachute team at Sheffield United, but just did not go well at all. For whatever reason, Slav, Sheffield United, the players, it didn't work, did it? And he was in 17th place and got the bullet to be replaced by Paul Heckingbottom, who'd already been caretaker manager at Sheffield United in the Premier League last season, pre Yukanovic arriving. December saw the Omicron variant of the COVID-19 pandemic sweep through the UK. Ultimately, it turned out to be a good thing for our general herd immunity, but in the short term, it played havoc with championship fixtures and squads throughout the month. Omicron was, however, not the only thing to sweep through the championship as here come Huddersfield, already sitting in a highly respectable eighth place. Huddersfield are now, from the start of December, about to go on a 17-match undefeated streak on their march towards a playoff spot. The short-lived experiment involving Frankie McAvoy at Preston ended in December. It never seems to work out too well when the assistant takes over. Ryan Lowe was plucked from the top of League One where he had Plymouth flying to take over at Deepdale. The year 2021 ended with Bournemouth back on top. Fulham second, but without a win in five. Blackburn was still flying at this point in third and a magnificent six game winning streak. Nine wins in the past 11 going into new year. Derby, Barnsley and Peterborough were already making up the bottom three there and they destined to drop. Middlesbrough, Sheffield United and Nottingham Forest all went into the new year lurking 
upwardly mobile after their managerial changes. Another new year began and it was welcome 2022. And look, what better way to celebrate retrospectively than hitting that like button and supporting the video and the channel. Fulham bounced back from their pre-Christmas jitters with an incredible run. They're going to go top after a ridiculous week where they beat Reading 7-0. Bristol City 6-2 and Birmingham 6-2 in consecutive games. They're going to get top and they are going to disappear into the distance. The long-awaited takeover at Hull finally happens. The alarms are gone and shortly after so is manager Grant McCann, the Turkish regime, replacing him with Shota Arveladze. Of course, the end of January brings us the closing of the transfer window with the headlines dominated by Bournemouth, who'd been overtaken by Blackburn in second and had an informed QPR side too, now breathing down their necks in fourth. The Cherries went all in and backed Scott Parker to the hill. Seven new arrivals throwing all of their chips in on promotion this season. January's Player of the Month award went to Bristol City's Antoine Semenyo and despite the league position, the Robins' attack was starting to gain plenty of plaudits. And not just Semenyo, his teammate Andy Vyman is going to end the season with a very, very respectable 22-goal figure. It was a new chapter at West Brom as we start February. Ron Gourlay is going to come in at the top of the club and Valerian Ishmael's short-lived tenure at the Hawthorns is going to be over before he even sees out a single season. The hottest property in championship managerial terms last season is going to be replaced by an old familiar face and it's welcome back to Steve Bruce. The simmering bad blood between Middlesbrough and Derby reached boiling point in February. Borough owner Steve Gibson had Mel Morris in his crosshairs for quite a long time and with Derby's administrators rather awkwardly silent, Morris had to step back in to reach an accord with Gibson over the claim Borough were pursuing over Derby. This was fairly well timed, it has to be said, as the two teams played each other a day after the accord was reached, with tensions threatening to boil over up at the riverside. Derby's naughty step friends Reading were also flying close to the sun. They'd won two in 19 games and were on a seven game losing streak with Velko Paunovic very, very much on the edge. They went up to Preston for what turned out to be Paunovic's last game in charge. He did get the win, but was ultimately replaced after the game with a bit of a left field appointment of Paul Ince. Back to Derby, and actually on the pitch, they were having a fairly good crack at going against this points deduction. Six wins in 11 took them to third from bottom, where many people had them finishing way behind everybody else. This was, however, all too much for Darren Ferguson over at Peterborough, whose side Derby overtook. Fergie left the posh, and with former manager Grant McCann now available after being released by Hull, he was plugged back in at Posh and took over from Ferguson. March saw Fulham move further into the distance and some fatal falls from other teams out of the top six. Blackburn were going to disappear from the promotion picture with just two wins in 15 from late January onwards. QPR were hitting the buffers and they lost an incredible seven games out of eight. West Brom's woes saw them drop all the way down to 14th in the middle of March. And up at the top, here come Luton. They barely played for an entire month during the Omicron spike, returned with an absolute vengeance and took a lot of points in their games in hand. Between New Year and the end of March, Luton won 11 out of 16 games. On the horizon as well were Nottingham Forest. They'd been very good since Steve Cooper arrived, done great things in the FA Cup as well. They had games in hand and a lot to do, but frankly, if their trajectory continued, they would end up in the playoffs or, God forbid, even higher. The same could be said for Millwall, who looked very dangerous after a five-game winning streak, their best run of the season going into early March. They looked like a very viable member of the chasing pack. 
down at the bottom, buoyed by a couple of good January loan signings, Barnsley had their best and only good run of the season and looked for a short while like they might turn around their seemingly disastrous season into possible survival. The start of April brought up our first really, really massive championship head-to-head -head as Barnsley hosted Reading at Oakwell in a huge survival scrap. A Barnsley win would make things really interesting at the bottom and they led for most of the game until a Tom Ince equaliser in the closing stages shut down Barnsley and looking back with hindsight, even though it was only early April, frankly, shut down the relegation picture. We went into the fabled Easter weekend with Fulham on the verge of clinching promotion and the bottom three on the verge of being cut decisively adrift. Forrest had now caught up to the point where they were looking Bournemouth's biggest threat in second, given they had games in hand over Huddersfield, who were effectively very close to closing in on a playoff spot. At the end of the Easter double header, Fulham were up, Derby were down. Fulham just had too much firepower and breezed promotion, frankly. Derby, well, they just had too much to do with their 21 points of deductions. Barnsley and Peterborough shortly after followed Derby down to League One the following weekend as Huddersfield confirmed their surprise playoff spot. The incredible chase being undertaken by Nottingham Forest to catch Bournemouth and frankly whoever was in front of them reached fever pitch on an incredible Tuesday night with both sides, Forest and Bournemouth, catching up on games in hand. Forest went to champions elect Fulham and won, whilst Bournemouth dropped points once again in a balmy 3-3 draw at Swansea. As we arrived in May, everything was pointing towards an insane head-to-head -head game between Bournemouth and Forest the midweek before the final round of fixtures. The gap was three points. If Bournemouth won, they were up. If Forest won, they would overtake Bournemouth and go into the final round of fixtures in second place, having not won any of their first seven games of the season. As it happened, an 80 third minute goal from Kiefer Moore won Bournemouth the game and promotion. In the end, the chase was close and a thrilling one, but on this occasion the tortoise could not quite get ahead of the hare on the penultimate corner before the home straight. On the final day with automatic promotion and relegation all sorted, all eyes were on the playoffs. We knew Huddersfield and Forest were finishing third and fourth. We thought Forest had taken third with a stoppage time winner, but that was only Forest taking the lead. There was an equaliser from Hull, which meant right at the death, the playoff places third and fourth switched. Sheffield United and Luton also had last day wins to hold on to fifth and sixth, giving us a playoff lineup of the two more surprise packages, Huddersfield and Luton, and traditional big boys, Forest versus Sheffield United. And so the championship 21-22 season is complete. It will be remembered as a record-breaking season for Fulham and their star striker who's 43 goals may take quite some beating over the coming decades probably. It'll also be remembered for Huddersfield and Luton punching their way into unlikely playoff spots and Steve Cooper's mighty turnaround during the season at Forest. It'll also be remembered less fondly at Derby as the season they went into full meltdown and got relegated with Reading nearly following suit. Off the pitch, I'm hopeful that this might be the season where we start on the road to reform in terms of fixing what is a glorious division but does appear to be a broken one at the moment. With FFP, the acceleration in parachutes, COVID, Project Big Picture and the Super League proposals, I think we're all hoping for more ground to be made on the sustainability of clubs and work towards at least softening these unfathomably big cliff edges in the TV distribution throughout English football. This still poses the biggest threat to the chaotic joy of what those who watch describe with absolutely no sense of irony as the best league in the world.